Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the University of Manitoba Alumni and Friends Virtual Learning for Life Alumni Scholars Series. My name is Tracy Bowen. I'm the Director of Alumni Relations here at the University of Manitoba and a proud UM alumna and today's moderator. Thank you for joining us and making this part of your day and happy St. Patrick's every day to all of those who celebrate in, in some sort of way with that. This series of the Virtual Learning for Life program is, is especially exciting as it gives us the great opportunity to profile many of our University of Manitoba alumni who are doing simply amazing things and excelling in every sector imaginable around the world, proving that alumni are one of the finest examples of how a degree from the University of Manitoba helps better our world. So before I introduce today's speaker, just a few housekeeping details. Uh, you are watching this via YouTube and we will send you the link again. So you're able to watch this again, this recording again, uh, or share with friends and family. Uh, as usual, we're using this, the platform Slido, that's www.slido.com, and the password is VL17. I know we, we had a bit of a confusion last week, uh, our apologies on sending the wrong one, but it is VL17. I encourage you to type your questions throughout the presentation as I will be uh, monitoring that site and we will be posting them during the Q&A portion at the end. We will try to get through as many as possible, uh, so please do keep your questions coming. So now I'd like to introduce today's speaker, who is Dr. Judith Bartlett, a two-time Max Rady College of Medicine graduate from the classes of 1987 and 2004, who will be speaking on the topic of best practices in inter intercultural health. Now let me share you a little bit about Judy so you have some background. She is a Métis physician, researcher, and health administrator. She developed the Manitoba Métis Federation Health and Wellness Department in Winnipeg, which plays a leadership role in its vision of a well Métis community by developing and using knowledge that is holistic and cultural based. Dr. Bartlett, Bartlett has a significant clinical experience as a physician and has participated in research and studies and projects around the world. And she is also the 2020 University of Manitoba Distinguished Alumni Award recipient in the very prestigious Lifetime Achievement category. And you can read more about Dr. Bartlett's very inspiring story and background if you go to the UM Today, the magazine fall edition, you can learn a lot more there. So with that, over to you, Dr. Bartlett. Okay. Here we are. I can't see you, but I'm hoping you can see me. So good afternoon. Um, today you, you heard I'm going to explore indigenous an in, indigenous holistic life promotion framework. Um, I'm going to talk about the origins of this framework, which was called the medicine wheel to begin with, then the Aboriginal, then Métis life promotion framework. And these days I'm calling it a holistic life promotion framework. I'm gonna go over a few of the things that it's been used for over the last three decades. And, but then I'll spend more time on, on the work I did at the Manitoba Métis Federation on research and knowledge translation. And I'm gonna, at the very end, talk about some possible broader uses. So why was it created? In 1989, the Aboriginal community uh, was purchasing the old uh, CP, uh, uh, Canadian Pacific Railroad station. And part of that work, uh, they went out and asked the Aboriginal community, what should be in there. And one of the things they requested was a holistic community health center. So, so that was one reason. Um, we, from that, we selected the medicine wheel as a philosophy and our approach had to meet some needs. It had to meet our community needs, but it also needed to meet the needs of the funders who were really focused on, on health promotion. And um, uh, finally, the, the probably the most important need that I felt there was, was to actually support clients to make informed life choices. So over the years, the, I'm not going to talk about all of these. I'm just going to talk about the last one. The Aboriginal Health and Wellness Center, that was in, started in 1997, but all of the pre-work on this framework 
occurred during those years between 1993 and 97. And it took us actually seven years to get core funding for that center. And it's still operating today. I've done wellness workshops. I can't count the number of workshops, personal and group uh, work. Um, I used it after uh, I went back to school again because I looked this framework, the framework and I said, is this actually even valid? Um, and so I looked at the first circle uh, with Métis and First Nations and, and as my master's thesis. There's been three environmental scans, one, two in Winnipeg um, using this framework, uh, one in Saskatoon and, and uh, also in Calgary where they used, they focused on, on um, children, but the other ones focused on a broad environmental scan and I'll, I'll talk a little bit about that. And, and the final area is my, my work at the MMF. So the basics, first of all, this framework is not culture. It's, it's simply a tool. It's intended to help people sort through life complexities. It's neutral relative to sex and gender. And it's about life promotion rather than health promotion, which is often stuck in the disease focus. Um, the, the health sector, you know, doesn't really have much choice but to focus on disease. So I'll start with first why it was created um, and how. So this was our starting point. Our, our first circle, uh, you can see, was the spiritual, emotional, physical, and intellectual or mental aspects, and the seven teachings or principles of living, caring, sharing, kindness, honesty, respect, trust, and humility. There are others but that, that get used, but I'll, I'll stick with that. But in reality, this is what our life looks like. Everything spins around us. It's so fast. It, you know, you can't tell where one one thing starts and another ends and it's it's often very complex very mixed up and and difficult to to try and sort out what's good actually going on in my life so this tool was intended to slow this process down so along with that first circle um, as others were working on the administrative sections of getting a, a community health center up and running Part of my job uh, was to go out and find out who's using medicine wheels and how are they using them. And I brought together four such medicine wheels and they're in the next slide. And again, it's simply about slowing down and simplifying life. So health and well-being is about, about seeking balance across these 16 elements. Balance of the spiritual, emotional, physical, and intellectual or mental aspects of a child, a youth, an adult, or an elder who live as individuals, members of families, communities, and nations, and with a, within a wide variety of cultural, social, economic, and political environments. And the, the, the cultural environment, I, I found out, I actually took this, this framework to, um, to uh, the Métis earlier than than I had used it um, with Métis and I did a presentation there and I didn't get a very um, open response to it and and I sort of learned eventually that the Métis felt that they did not own this framework it belonged to First Nations so I just left that be then. So in 2005, when I when I actually went to work at the Manitoba Mayfield Federation and do my research out of their offices, I just took the 16 elements and I placed them around the infinity flag, and and they this was acceptable. This was these 16 elements are simply things that people live. At one point, I actually did a, a, a workshop with a, a whole group of, of senior Inuit, and they also, they said, it's just common sense. So, so this is a Métis form. This was the general population form in a matrix, and the reason it was there is at the time, I just didn't know how to create 
uh, circles on my computer. This was way back in early 1990s. So really though, as diverse human beings, we all live the same 16 elements every day of our lives, but we each learn, uh, um, we each do the, live them uniquely in, within our own way. This is an example of the hi a highlight of the, the, the first publication by the United Way uh, of the Eagle's Eye View, the environmental scan. And I actually was going to take the slide out, but it's still here. Um, and, and so you can see the 16 areas and within each one of those, there's a, a whole lot of information about the Aboriginal community and services it, it, it does to, to support it, the Aboriginal community. So in terms of characteristics, I'm not gonna go through all of the characteristics in detail, but one of them that's very important is, is the idea of respect for diversity of different ways of being in the world. So if we look at, at spirituality, for instance, and I wish I had a pointer, but you can see where it says Métis, that's I'm Métis and I chose to define spirituality and, and think about spirituality and practice spirituality and ground myself by fasting in the mountains. And I did that for seven years in the summers. I did uh, a three, four day fast. Or it could be a First Nation woman or man who chooses to, to symbolize their spirituality through the church. So, so that's the whole idea is that it's, it's not about there being just one way to think about spirituality. There are many ways. And whether you're First Nation, Métis, Cree, Ojibwe, whichever, or other pop cultures, everyone has their own way of doing that. Whoops, I went the wrong way, sorry. Um, so one of the things that's that's important is, is about the whole as a means integration as well. So for every element in this 16 element framework, you can, you can move an element to the center and you look at all of the other elements and how they relate. So for instance, if we wanna move the child to the center, the real meaning of a child, if you're looking at what does this, what's the meaning of child? It's really the sum of all the meanings because a child is not standalone, nor is an adult standalone or, or social standalone. They all have these, these complexities with them. Um, other characteristics, it's easy to understand and a tool for self-discovery. Like, for instance, you know, a 10 or a 12-year-old might be able to create meanings for those 16 words with a little bit of help and with a teacher that understands how to work with 10, 10 or 12-year-olds. Um, it supports a, a, a person having a sense of coherence in their life. Life has to make sense. Um, in this case, a, a person sits in the middle of the circle and, and you have to look at all of the elements. Reciprocal a, a action is something really important and it was important to me because it meant that as um, uh, Métis community members attend the Aboriginal Health and Wellness Centre, it was important that they lead the process of their own health and well-being. So if you think of these 16 elements that are in the First Nation format, but you, you think of them, they're actually a globe and all 16 of, the, of those elements are spinning all around that. Think of it as a balloon. So if you touch one point and press in, the rest of the balloon will change. So what that meant is that if a person came in and they decided to, to work on their physical body, something in their physical self, you know, maybe they're going to take up some kind of, you know, sport or Tai Chi or something like that. That physical, making a change in that physical, it affects everything else and everything else changes. So it means that no matter what a client comes in for, that they lead what they want to work on. And often if they work on things that they're already doing well on, um, that still allows things to change. 
it it's works both at the, the person and the society level. Um, you can do personal assessments and societal and assessments as well. And it provides a common uh, general vision and a context for collective action. And I'll show you how that happens in the work with the Manitoba Métis uh, Federation. This framework also needed to accommodate both traditional and contemporary ways. So the next slides, I'm going to tell you about wellness workshops and, and how these are, are used. First, how, how a wellness workshop um, is done. So the first thing is that if you, it, you usually work with a group and the individuals have, um, uh, they have two sheets of paper and each sheet of paper has these 16 terms on them. And they're asked to define the word, the, the word. So if you start with the word spiritual, and I said, to me, spiritual means the connection to all things. On my second piece of paper, to ground me in the here and now, it's about how am I feeling about my meaning right now? So do I feel, in, do I feel spiritually connected right now or not connected? So that works back and forth on those two sheets till you finish the, the 16 um, elements. And that information is tucked away and it's never shared with anybody. And an interesting thing I found with doing many, many workshops is that, that men, I was surprised that men actually like doing this workshop because they, they don't actually have to, um, feel like they're exposing themselves in it in any way and and women as well sometimes people have things going in their life where they don't want to tell anybody about it so so that way they 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 get a sense of of themselves i just asked them a general question what did you learn about yourself and did anything surprise you what often people say is they're surprised that they're more balanced than they thought they were so the next uh, step is actually to do the same work, but with a group. And you only use the, the, the first worksheet. You don't actually um, go into the grounding part. And in that first worksheet, you, you do the same thing as a group. You say you get everyone's meanings on all of these terms. So for spiritual, for emotional, for physical, for intellectual, and so on. One of the really important things to do and, and uh, is, is that to ensure that people don't try to come to consensus on, on the meaning of these words. What's more important is getting everybody's, everybody's terms down. So once you've finished that, you've, you've done your individual work, you've tucked that away, you've done your group work, you've tucked that away, now you're ready to do actual wellness areas and you're, you're ready to create wellness areas. So it's a fairly easy process. It didn't seem easy when, when, when I was first working on this because I had this, this matrix that, that was just these 16 elements. And, and I kept looking at it and looking at it and looking at the, the, the circular format and trying to figure out how to, how to how to do this. Now, the reason I even developed wellness wellness areas is probably important that you know. While at the Aboriginal Health and Wellness uh, Center, I was on the board and I was doing volunteer clinical work, and and uh, we hired a physician to to put the Canadian Diabetes Association uh, minimal standards of clinical care into policy form for, for our, our health center policy. And my job was to review that policy and see if, if it fit our needs. So as I was reviewing the policy, I, I thought, oh, what we have here in these minimal standards of clinical care is about 95% about the physical body. And the question arose in my head that if we have minimal standards of clinical care, why don't we have minimal standards of wellness care? So that's when I had to start searching and, and saying, 
So how do I create wellness areas? And, and so it was looking at that matrix and looking at that circle. And one day I decided to simply extend the lines uh, above and across and, and this gave the, um, the wellness areas. Now, what a group does, uh, they finished their personal, their group assessment of, of those 16 terms. Now they look at groups of four terms. So they would look at the terms spiritual, emotional, physical, and intellectual together as a group. And they would write in the blank space a term that could capture what those meant together. And they would do the same for spiritual child individual culture and, and put, put those four terms together. And what was that, that was for that about? What was the, that column saying? And, and so over many, many, many workshops, um, I've, these, these wellness areas have been honed and honed and honed. People often came up with the same terms over and over and over again. So I so now this is the actual uh, uh, final form, but this should not be used. These this form should not be used unless the group has first gone through the first the first three three parts of this, because if you simply say just trust me, I've done all the work and I and I know this this is good, then you're not really letting people. Uh, walk a path of informed decision making. So if you see, and I again, I don't have a pointer, but you see there's numbers beside this where nature is one, identity is two, development is three, and relationships uh, are four and so on. So sorry, I'm just putting my timer back on here to make sure I'm on time. So, so and over time, this became the meanings of these nature, that spiritual, emotional, physical, and intellectual. That's who we really are. That's 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 who we come from, spirit world from. Um, whatever your belief is, you may believe that you 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 just you know you're born and that's where it starts. But more and more research is is, is showing that 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 people have some things that they come with. Um, our identity is our created self. That's that's our self that 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 it's based on on interaction with other people. And we slowly create an identity that we we flex back and forth off of people until we come to an identity that that we're happy with. And sometimes like me, it takes a lifetime. Development, that's our age, chronological age, but it's also the qualities or, or characteristics. For instance, the uh, wisdom uh, for, uh, for elder, but wisdom can be part of a child too. Spontaneity in a child, that can be part of an, an elder or an adult, you know, inquisitiveness of, of a youth, um, re responsibility of, of, a, of a, a, an adult. So those four areas need to be active in in all of our chronological ages they're important parts of who we are for myself for instance i found it a, uh, a few years ago that i had really separated myself from the child part of myself and and uh, luckily i have small had small grandchildren where i could start start to practice getting back some of that playfulness again um, but it's still never easy for me <laughs> Relationships, it's how we respect and care for one another. Uh, networks, is, those are how, how and the levels we interact with one another as individuals, members, families, communities, nations. Now, community has its own you know, groups inside that, et cetera. Supports, that's what supports us, our home, our body, our income, our neighborhoods, the built world, the natural world. Environment, oops, sorry. Environments is a little different. I use it a little differently here than we see as, you know, global warming or things like that. It's really about the cultural, social, economic and political environments that we live in that influence us and that we can influence. And finally, governance is about voice. It's about determining your destiny. 
It's about being heard. It's about hearing others and listening uh, to one another. For those of you who who have a harder time seeing how that circle, that matrix, was a a, a circle, this incorporate this incorporates it back from the matrix into the circle. And you can see nature, who you really are, will influence your identity, which will influence how you develop, which will influence your relationships you can create, which influence the networks that you can create, which influence the supports that are in your, that, that you have, that influence the environments that you live in and influence your voice. Now, these uh, arrows are going in one direction, but they can be two directional. Um, networks can influence your relationships and relationships can influence your development, but it's just a nice path uh, of being able to show how this is. For Métis, I actually put these eight wellness areas on, on, on a, a Red River cart form. So, the next thing I'm going to do is look at the the uh, uh, the work I did at the Management Federation Research and and um, Knowledge Translation. So we wanted holistic Métis knowledge development, and and uh, so in 2005, when I started the Health and Wellness Center myself, and and. Uh, uh, a woman by the name of Sheila Carter, who went on to be the director after I left, we were asked to uh, develop a document that set out the needs for Métis in Manitoba. And what we found out was there was very little known, very little known. There were some some information from from uh, survey data, uh, which was a sample of a sample. So and it was only at the provincial level. So, so it was really difficult to know what the actual health status was, was of Métis across the province, not simply one number for, for all of Métis in Manitoba. Um, so the first thing we knew that we had to do was we had to do a study to look at, at Métis health status. So we approached the Manitoba Center for Health Policy and the, the late uh, Dr. Patricia Martins and I were the co-investigators on a large Métis health status and health services study that we call the, called the Métis Atlas for short. Um, what was most important about doing this work was that it wasn't simply about doing a one-off consultation to, to figure out what are Métis health priorities. It was to develop this health status report and then have Métis citizens help to interpret what's going on. If this report simply went to the health system, it would get inter interpreted by the health system by, by, by themselves. And then we really wouldn't know what Métis thought. So it was important that, that, that Métis were involved. So I wanted to develop an ongoing long-term engagement process in and around this study. So, and the other thing I had to do was, first off, we had to know what is knowledge. And then I had to, to figure out how do I demystify the, the uh, research process, the data collection and knowledge translation. So, Here's the, the, the first thing I looked at was uh, a slide. This was by um, a, a person by the name of Burton Jones, and he looked at Indigenous knowledge development and Western knowledge development. And he said, Indigenous knowledge development starts with the narrative. That's the myths, the stories. It goes through experience before it becomes knowledge. So, so the person has to have an experience and then it's, it's, it's knowledge. Whereas Western knowledge development, its large base is data and facts that then get synthesized into knowledge. Now I see in some ways the indigenous knowledge development is a more personal knowing and the Western knowledge development is, is a more global 
abstract knowing, um, in, you know, so, so that's just my thoughts on it. But being a Métis, it was difficult for me to have to choose between these. So I thought I have to, I, I must as a Métis um, honor both my ancestral heritage, my European and my indigenous ancestral ter uh, heritages that made me Métis. And, and I'm not either one of those anymore, I'm simply Métis. So this is what I did with, with these two little triangles. I combined them to develop a, 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 a holistic approach to being uniquely Métis. So if we look at this, the spirit, it goes back to that little circle, that first medicine wheel, spiritual, emotional, physical, intellectual. The spiritual are, are the narratives, the myths and, and the legends. The experience is, is emotional. Data are the physical data, the things you do the number crunching with and make the graphs with. And information is the intellectual process of, of synthesizing that, that, uh, the, those reams and reams of data that get punched out of, out of, a, uh, of a data set. So seeking Métis knowledge for health and well-being, it's our story. That's the spiritual. What's our vision? Our experience. Where are we now? The emotional. Our data. How does this add facts, those physical facts, and our synthesis, finding a solution together? So the next thing I needed to simplify was this whole construct of quantitative and qualitative. I, I'll, I'll tell you a really quick story. Um, when I was first went back to school, I had, I started with grade 10 education and I was in upgrading at Red River College. And then I went into the first year of a biological technology program. And I ended up dropping out. I didn't understand the language. I didn't have the math to be able to do the physics. But I recall one experiment was, was one, one course was called semi-qualitative and semi-quantitative uh, data analysis. And I, it just, it, it was over my head. I did not know what semi-qualitative meant. I did not know what semi-qualitative meant. I did not know enough even to separate the words into quality and, and, uh, and quantity. I just was not there at, at that point in my life. So this is what I came up with that that I take that we were could take to our communities. So that we look at our story, narrative, spiritual, our experiences, emotional uh, in the community, the region, and the RHAs, that's the knowledge network interactions, is qualitative um, in in essence. And if we look at the data and the synthesis of that data is more of a quantitative in, in essence. Now, there's no real validity to, to this. Uh, I haven't researched it in any way. It's simply a way to take this big uh, concept called research and put it into something that our community could say, oh, well, yeah, it's not that hard. It's not that difficult. Yes, we can participate. So what a, what a knowledge network was, was we brought together the MMF region offices. There are seven region offices. At that time, there were 11 regional health authority offices. I think there's maybe only five now. And we brought them together uh, as an equality-based partnership. The Métis, what Métis brought is our, our identity, our culture, our history. Um, Métis had, had socioeconomic and, and, and other health programs, housing, things like that. Um, we had our human resource uh, to, uh, part to play, our central MMF health and wellness department core uh, professional staff and the region staff. And we had the lived experience of Métis citizens. The RHA brought to the table the, the financial flexibility and constraints, policies, uh, health programs, um, professional and technical expertise, and concerns brought forward by, by their health consumers. 
the big um i would say the big key in in this was the metis health data study that study was owned by the metis people and and i insisted that it could not be shared with anyone until our community saw it first so the regional health authorities were really glad to participate in these knowledge networks we always had senior staff from 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 the regional health authorities and and because they got to look at this data with us and and uh with their with their lens and our lens so knowledge network activity the first thing that they would do is they would do a, a, an orientation on knowledge creation and it's just those three little slides that i showed you uh, um, and and then they would they would uh, uh, decide on the parameters of the knowledge network partner relationship. What could they do? What could they not do? And I I used a, a public participation spectrum for that. Uh, it it's involved consult collaborate with empower and I can't remember the last one. No. Oh my my throat is getting a little a little uh, hoarse here. I haven't talked for so long in a long time. So the next step is to do the series of wellness workshops, exactly what I went through before. So this, this knowledge network that included the MMF region office, the RHA, and a couple of my staff from the central office, usually on the first knowledge network, I was there for every first knowledge network, but my staff and all, and they did the personal work, they did the group work, they created the wellness areas, and they had a fourth workshop, and this was their fourth workshop result, and it was a 10-year vision based on those well wellness areas. So now you had a joint vision between the health system and Métis citizens, and, and it was positive. This was planned very, um, very uh, precisely because I had been involved in First Nation health. I worked for federal government in what was then called medical services branch for all First Nations communities. And often the relationship between government and First Nations was 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 strained. It was difficult. It, it, there was it was always a struggle. And, and I wanted this to be different. And I knew that for it to be different, we had to have common ground because we were going to have to talk about some really very difficult um, uh, health status. And unless you are together on where you wanna go, what your vision is, it's, it's hard not to get into all of the emotions of looking at the data, but what this does is it, it sets that back. And, and so, and the same thing happens at the community level. So the information that we got from there would be, would look like this as well. We would, we would then show them the top uh, seven chronic diseases. We, we did this for every region. This is for the province overall, but for every seven, for each of the seven Métis regions and the 11 regional health authorities, we had a, a, a graph like this so that so that we could see everything from the perspective of Métis um, cultural organization and of regional health organization. So, so in this, you can see, I don't know how large this is on your screen, but what this shows is that except for osteoporosis, Métis had a statistically higher prevalence of chronic diseases compared to all Manitobans. Now that gap could have been, would have looked even wider um, if First Nations had not been part of the all Manitoba group. But we didn't want to separate that out because we didn't want this to be about First Nations versus Métis. But the gap between Métis and all Manitobans who are not First Nations would have been even wider than this. In this uh, large study, there was more than 80 health, health and social indicators, including education for 91,000 Métis 
76 of a thousand of whom, whom were alive in, in 2010. Um, so we were able to look at long-term uh, um, mortality rates uh, for uh, premature mortality rates and mortality rates. So uh, for this, but I'm, I'm not going to spend any time going into the, the data itself because I don't think you really want to listen to data. This next slide is really busy, but it's, it's not anything you actually have to learn or, 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 or think about. It's, it's just um, to give you an overall sense of the activities flow for a knowledge network. And some of it you've, you, I've already described. So this is the, the little triangles at the top. That was, that was the, the, the knowledge network on their first day. They, got it, they had those workshops about research, what's knowledge, what's research, quantitative, qualitative. Then they did the three workshops. That's where you see the little flag using the, the medicine wheel as as uh, doing the the wellness workshops, then the little oval uh, is is the um, the health status study, and of course we couldn't hand them a 60, 600 page document and say, well here it is, um, just you know go through it. Instead, what we had already done is is we had pulled out the seven chronic diseases. My staff and I, in advance of all of this took each took an atlas and we went through that that atlas that 600 page report each one of my my staff they were all uh, professional staff each took one chronic disease and they went through the atlas and they pulled in every other chart that might have a relationship or education or something smoking you know all those kinds of, of behavioral things and they they had those ready so, so then the, the, the next uh, two-day workshop, then the Knowledge Network could then start looking, put, pulling all this data together and be able to, to look at their three chronic diseases. They spent a couple more, three more days um, on, on this. And at that point in the last, their, their last three days, one for each chronic disease, what we did is we added what was in the literature. Everything was put on cards. So in, in all of this, all this data was transferred into cards. So we added what was in the literature, what came out of the wellness workshops with, with Métis communities from across the province, uh, what, uh, what, what did the health services, what kind of health services were available. Um, and so there was a whole bunch of different things we added to that. So what would happen is, is the group would, would finally place all of this information on a wellness wall. And it would again look like that 10 year vision wall so that they could look up at the wall and they would be able to see the whole of, of all of the data. And what was surprising is that you could so clearly see where the gaps were whether you know it was under nature or development or identity or relationships uh, you could see where the gaps were so once that was done then all those cards came back off the wall and we went through a sorting process because that that this circle was the metis way the 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 um car, the cart uh, red river cart wheel was the metis way of looking at this data but we couldn't put ourselves on the RHA and say, well, you have to look at it the way we do. What we did is we took all the cards down and we sorted through them together as a group and, and put them in a format that the, that the regional health authority could use to develop their, their uh, to adapt their programs or their policy or their any, anything they could or couldn't do. They had the information then. It was just an amazing process. Uh, there was 100% participation. I think we had one, uh, one RHA that chose not to participate, but everyone was really loved this process. It was um, uh, selected as one of 14 best practices in community engagement by the uh, CIHR for their for their uh, community engagement casebook, and you can find that online. So, 
Now, I'm almost at the end of this. I, I've lost track of my time here. I hope I'm not too far over. Oh, 35 minutes. Okay. So possible broader uses. I actually have a nine-week detailed wellness workshop series that's already been field tested that's ready to go. I just haven't got to doing it yet. It's one more of those things that I'm sitting on waiting and saying, okay, when am I going to start this? And the other thing I thought is that the wellness workshop process itself might be a great thing to add to a reconciliation toolbox. Because I've done this with different multicultural and multidisciplinary groups. I've done I, I can't count how many workshops I've done, but people always come out finding common ground and understanding. They find out that, that we're not so different. And usually our differences are only in our symbols, our way we symbolize things in the world. And people always leave with a different mindset than what they started with. And, you know, you can build friendships out of something like this. It's, it's intimate enough to get to know somebody, but not too intimate that you ever have to share personal details. So that's so that is the end of the presentation. I am quite happy to answer any questions. And I actually don't know where to go from here. Just you don't need to. You don't need to worry about that. Well, yeah. I'll uh, I'll manage that. All all Perfect. of that. Perfect. Thank you so much, Dr. Bartlett. That was really fascinating. And uh, I was jotting down a few of my own questions um, before we uh, get to some of the questions from our from our listeners. And so, you know, what I found that was really interesting when, when you said just in the previous slide about, you know, the common ground and how people realize they're not so different one, from one another, but there can be, you know, just I, my, my background's in market research years before in this job. And just when you talked about the quantitative and qualitative, and I wrote down here that, you know, the colonial terminology that we use, right? You know, if you use things like intellectual, physical, emotional, spiritual, like that really spoke to me in terms of, you know, it's the same thing, but it's different. And it's just, you know, again, making sure that everybody from where, where they come from has a has a shared understanding. So, so thank you for all of that. So um, while I, I encourage everyone to, to submit their questions, I'm wondering if you could share sort of what has been your biggest aha moment through all of this in developing the wellness workshops? What, you know, what have you learned uh, that you could share with us that, that big, big finding that you've discovered? Well, for me personally, it, it was, it, it was actually using that first circle of the medicine wheel to sort out some some issues in my life and and uh where where i had figured well i i had worked for many 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 years on my emotions worked on my physical body i was in top-notch shape my intellect i had many 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 years of of study and 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 but where i had a gap was in spiritual and so I chose to, to explore that spirituality by going up that mountain and fasting. And that first time I went up the mountain, uh, uh, I had an experience that changed my life. Uh, it made me see the world different. And it was that trip up the mountain that then resulted in the creation of the rest of the framework and, and knowing sort of what needs to go in there. Mm -hmm. so, so yeah, um, I just find it's 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 I've done the personal assessment myself. I I I always know I, um, after I've done it a few times. If I find out it's always one area, and it's usually the spiritual area that I haven't been paying attention to, and I get unbalanced, and I have to start working on that again. You know, it's it's interesting you say that because I would agree with that by my myself as well. Without going through it, but just you know, just thinking of it top of mind, I'd say that's where I'm probably the weakest too, and don't spend a lot of time with that. So, 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 thank you for that. Um, so, you know, what what could some of our listeners take away as you know actionable items for them? Like, what could they start to do differently or better? Um, you know, as a result of of your research, your findings. Well. 
I think that the, the, there's a symbol thing that they could do. They they could take these these 16 terms and put them in the form of a, of a medicine wheel because that's the easiest way to, to see the holism um, and write out their meanings. And, and uh, like people were always very surprised uh, of, of, of things they thought they understood like social mm -hmm. that they didn't understand at all, you mm -hmm. know, or, or, or community. They, they had a hard time figuring out, well, what is community? So, so just simply doing that, that for yourself in, in just private of doing the meanings and then and, and you, you and then doing doing the the grounding so you start with spiritual what does it mean where am i right now so you get these two sheets and it gives you a sense of of what does my world like look like for me mm -hmm. and how often should people be doing that like what kind of is it like what kind of check-in should people be doing like every six months as every year like i mean this is a year like no other so so what do you recommend in terms of those timelines well, they can, I mean, they can do it once if they want, or they can, I mean, I wouldn't do it more than every, every couple of years for sure. Um, but even doing it once it might be enough, you know, to, to be able to, to know where, where, where you get off track. You right. know, personal uh, gaps are. Yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. Uh, Dr. Berlin, we have a question that's just come through. I'll just ask our, our folks to, perfect, thank you so much. <laughs> so the question is, do the Métis and First Nations engage more in individualistic spirituality or collective one? And how are the two practiced? What a great question, thank you. Well, I can't speak for First Nations. Um, I can speak for, for what I know of the Métis. Um, and, it's it's a balance like uh, a lot of Métis uh, uh, go use the church for their spiritual life, but in my study, uh, looking at at uh, health help the meaning of well being for 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 Métis and First Nations, well, they had all kinds of things of way, ways they they express their or live their their spiritualism. Sometimes it's it's something as simple as going for a walk, being in nature, you know, um, dancing, uh, anything that brings you joy. Uh, so so and so I don't know that it's about co a collective. I don't think there is such a thing as one spirituality, even within a, within a group. Métis is such a diverse culture. As we started the Aboriginal Health and Wellness Centers, that was one of the things I needed to consider in that framework is saying, we have such a diverse Aboriginal community um, going from, from urban, rural, rural people who grew up rurally, who grew up urban, in urban environment, people who grew up in a traditional, people who grew up in, in contemporary. We had to find something that, that could be accepting of everyone's point of being and really we're all individual human beings and and yes you know a, a small metis community might have most of the people going to a catholic church um a first nation community might have the same thing or they might have you know another form of church or uh, there, 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 there could be doing ceremonies. Métis do ceremonies as well, you know. So, so it's it's this it's this continuum ways of being in the world. Yeah, what, what great advice that makes a, that makes a lot of good sense. Um, uh, while we're we're waiting for some more questions, something that came to my mind when I was looking at that huge screen on, on that, that slide you had of the 10 year vision and all the post-it notes you had in those various different ways and the, the color coordinating of it. So um, I'm really interested to know, and I'm, I'm not sure if you're able to speak to this about sort of where you're at with that 10 year vision or, or where the MMF is and the health authorities are on the 10 year version, sort of what year are we? How close are we to meeting the vision that was, that was set out in those early meetings? Well, I honestly can't tell you that because I left the MMF in 2012. Um, 
But what I do know that is somewhere around, and I left the university in, in 2015, so it was sometime uh, it, between 2016 and 17. The the way the 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 program was funded at the MMF was the province funded the director and uh, uh, one other staff and 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 the knowledge network coordinators and all of the other research people were funded through through uh, being successful in writing grants through CIHR or the Canadian Public Health the Public Health Association uh, the, the Public Health of Canada so so is a lot of was grant money and so in about 2016 17 whenever the government changed okay. the funding was the funding was cut oh okay well, i'm sorry yeah. to hear you. so yeah. you don't have a sense if sort of they're still on that pathway for that 10 year vision or uh, there's no the the infrastructure is gone this is this is one of the really difficult uh things of working in community so often you're you're really at the whim of what governments are in place uh, and and it's a difficult um, it's a difficult thing to work in community because you've worked so hard to bring people along and get them excited about doing something and then they fall flat on their face. Mm -hmm. Yeah, all you that know? momentum you've gained and, and the trust, as you said, right? Exactly, that, exactly. You know. So I mean, there were times when I was doing work in community. It was. A lot of it was in volunteer work is uh, we wouldn't even go after certain proposals because we said, you know, unless unless you can guarantee us that this is going to continue for, you know, at least 10 years, then we're not doing it mm -hmm. because we cannot take our community through that process again. So so I mean, it, it the, the process, it was such a good process and, and fully accepted by the regional health authorities and and the MMF but things got so that they there just wasn't an ability to work together mm -hmm, mm -hmm. but it well, doesn't mean somebody else can't can't try this right yeah no it sounds like it's a really great model to to use for the future and I, I do hope that some momentum was gained in terms of that ultimate wellness for, for the Métis communities. What was the breakdown between um, involvement from uh, both, um, I guess, both participants as well as the health authorities in terms of that rural urban split in Manitoba? Uh, well, we every regional health authority had had a two to at least two to three senior managers at the at the Knowledge Network. So Winnipeg was more difficult because it doesn't it didn't operate the same way as other ones operated. Um, so Winnipeg was was more difficult. We did have a knowledge network, but it it didn't move along as well as it could have, uh, simply because the city was so uh, um, large that that by the time I was leaving there, it, there was a, a need to to go at it maybe by community area as mm -hmm. opposed to by the city itself. Yeah. Right. Yeah. No, that makes good sense. Um, maybe this this answers the question that I'm going to ask you, which is so if someone were to, you know, l let's say that this this program was back in action, they had the funding, they were able to keep it going. Um, what advice would you give to to new leadership or those who are involved with running this program as to, you know, based on what you observed as your opportunities and challenges? What what big advice would you give them? Well, I, I think the, the, the advice is that everyone who, who gets involved in something like this are doing it for the right reasons. And um, the regional health authorities were really very happy to be able to have access to Métis health status information and relationships because they didn't know how to reach those. I, I would say that that if they want to get involved in something like this, their best bet is to get connected with their with the MMF region office mm -hmm. and the MMF central health and wellness department. They still have a person there, but of course, you know, without the funding and uh, it it just it, this was it, it was intensive work. So. Mm -hmm. 
Do they still have the infrastructure to maintain that information? Because you're right. I mean, it's you know, uh, based on you know the information that you keep, and do you have that ability to to maintain it? Yes. What 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 we did? Uh, have you heard of OCAP, the Ownership Control Access and Possession? That's the First Nations way of of looking at data sets. Okay. So what we put in 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 place instead was ownership control access and stewardship okay. so so because i thought you know why should we have to create uh, an infrastructure to hold data when everyone else holds their data in the manitoba center for health policy so data is in the manitoba center for health policy there's a data sharing agreement with them we you know during the process of of, of, of doing this study, we set up data sharing agreements with Manitoba Health, with Cancer Care. So that data is there. From that data, how, how we did runoff studies, because the, the, the large study doesn't give you age and sex, it's just Métis. So we, but we needed to know about diabetes, you know, age and sex, we needed to know. And so what we're able to do is to, to uh, contract the Manitoba Centre to do a data run for us on Métis and diabetes and age and sex, you know, with all of the different indicators. So they would they would give us the 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 output and my staff would graph it all. So we we looked in detail uh, of age and sex for cancer, diabetes, mental health, uh, cardiovascular disease. So all of those studies are on the MMF website. But and the the large Métis study is on the MMF website and it's also in the Manitoba Centre. But the data itself is housed in the Manitoba Centre. That you can only access it by getting permission first from the Manitoba Métis Federation, then uh, Manitoba Health because they have a stake in it because it it's using their health data, and then the Manitoba Centre for Health Policy. So I would encourage students to to uh, to do Métis research. Yeah, no, thank you for that. But the reports you said are on the Manitoba Métis Federation. So if, if our listeners wanted to go check that out, they could read read that information there. Yes, just go to mmf.mb.ca, go into Health and Wellness Department, and there'll be a, a drop down where you can see where the reports are. Wonderful. Okay, so 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 the note to all the listeners to make sure to do that. There's a lot of great data that's in there right now. So those are all the questions that we have right now. And so you you did such a wonderful job, Dr. Bartlett. That it was very robust. Lots of great information that we share with everyone. Uh, so thank you to all of our listeners for for uh, for tuning in over the last hour. We will be sending you the link today. So especially there was a lot of great information that Dr. Bartlett shared. So I encourage you to to review it again as there's a lot to digest as well in terms of information that was on uh, in her PowerPoint. And uh, as, as we just talked about, please do go to the MMF website to get further information on the reports that she was mentioning. Uh, next week's presentation at the same time uh, is another 2020 uh, University of Manitoba Distinguished Alumni Award recipient, uh, Kimberly Prost. She's an international criminal court judge. She'll be joining us from The Hague in the Netherlands. Uh, and as a special treat, it will not be me who will be the moderator. It will be our acting dean of the Faculty of Law, David Asper. It will be, uh, next week's session will be more of a, a fireside conversational chat going back and forth. I do know uh, in speaking with Kimberly, she's been quite busy over the last several months with a number of trials that she's been uh, she's been involved in. And so, as you may know, the International Criminal Court tries individuals for genocide, war crimes, crimes against humanity, and crimes of aggression. So, I'm sure she will be able to share with us uh, what is publicly available in in the trials that she's been uh, that she's been serving over. So, if you haven't registered, I encourage you to do so. And also, as I mentioned earlier, as at St. Patrick's Day, if you don't have plans this evening, I encourage you to join us and fellow UM alumni at our trivia night, St. Patrick's. Patrick's Day edition. You can find that information if you follow us on Facebook or Instagram. There's links right there to register, as well as you could go to the University of Manitoba alumni webpage. And again, a link right there so you're able to join. It's not too late to register. So I encourage you to do that if you have an interest and there's lots of great prizes to be won. 
All you need is a computer, a smartphone, and a thirst for fun trivia. So with that, thank you everybody for joining us. As we said, we'll be sharing this presentation, this recorded presentation, and the survey to, to provide us with feedback. And I encourage you to provide us with feedback as it's the only way we're able to improve. Thank you again. Enjoy your week. We will see you next Wednesday. Have a great day.